Welcome to this session on open source software uh, in the research and education landscape. My name is Casper Dreef and I'm joined here with my colleague and boss and manager and friend, Nicole Harris. Um, Hi everyone, um, I'm Nicole Harris. Um, I work at Jean with Casper, as he just said. Um, we both work in the trust identity and security area. Um, so this isn't necessarily something you would expect us to be talking about. Um, but it's an initiative we're setting off within Géant at the moment, and we're hoping to take forward and to reinvigorate the use of open source software in the RE environment. Yes, and before we start with the presentation, we'd like to uh, have this session a bit discussion based. So if you have questions or comments throughout uh, the session, just raise your hand and um, you can ask your questions anytime. And actually, even before we start with the presentation, we'd like uh, to run a very short survey. And now I have to, I'm hoping that the share screen, uh, screen sharing works again. Um, let me share this screen and it should. Yes. So we'd like to ask you, some of you already have your laptops open, or otherwise you can also grab your phone, um, to go to uh, menti.com. Um, and then you'll be asked to um, use the uh, code, which is at the top, but also at the bottom. You can also simply uh, look into, ah, I see people coming in. That's one thumbs up. And anyone watching online, you, you can could do also, this too. Yeah. So you can, go, if you're online, you can go to menti.com and enter the code 22029186. Hopefully we'll get a few more people in. Three people in now. Four. Slowly getting there. If any difficulties logging in, let us know. Maybe we can help out. Seven, you can also join during, well, as long as you have the code. So maybe leave it open for a little longer. Seven. Good to go. Good to right. go, I think. Yeah. So we'd like to ask you a couple of questions before we um, start um about open source software in your organization and i hope it will go to the next slide yes so does your organization support open source software the open source software philosophy yes there was immediate response by <laughs> two so it's yes no i don't know four yeah. I think that's a hundred percent score. People uh, support this. This that's good because that means that we can have a good discussion today. Um, second question: um, Does your organization use open software services? And uh, if yes, what services are you using at the moment? It's an open question, so type it in. It will appear on the screen. I think it also does multiple answers. So. Simple SAML. So, some people from the Federation space. Linux, open LDAP. Asterisk, do you know what asterisk is? I don't. So, it's always nice to learn new things. file sender. Wow, an entire list of services.
Right. So quite a long list. Um, it's also good for us to know because we keep these results and can go back to our organization and say people are actually using this. So this is very useful um, for the community. Career IMAP. All right. Well, substantial list. And I, oh, even more. Jagger, good. Quite a lot of people from the uh, Federation side of uh, our world. Yeah, and a lot of focus on the more operational um, elements of open source, so less user-facing, I'd say, here. Uh, more down, further down the stack, and then moving up into the layer um, of, of LDAP and identity, um, but only really a couple that are more user-focusing, which is interesting. All right, and I... Th mm. So for those of you using OSS, um, are you running into barriers? Um, you probably are. And if yes, and it's also a multiple multiple answers are, are possible here. Um, what what are the barriers for you to 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 run these services? Maintenance? Oh, well, across the board, basically. Yes, yeah, so I think that's interesting that maintenance is coming up strongly. Um, often people can get on board, uh, implement the open source software to begin with, but then it needs the support, it needs the, uh, the commitment from the organization, it needs frequent updates. And then on from the other side, it also needs uh, committers to frequently update and keep it relevant as well. And I think all of these things will come up um, as we talk further. All right. This is not the last survey we'll do today, so <laughs> keep your laptops open. Um, get back to the other screen. So, Nicole. Okay, um, so. Let's talk in a little bit more detail um, about open source. Um, I always really like this um, it's XKCD, um, a little cartoon. It's a bit difficult to see on this screen. Um, but here we have a huge stack, a whole building of infrastructure. And then right down here at the bottom. Here. Um, and that's labeled as a piece of software being maintained by um, one guy in the middle of nowhere for a very long time. Um, and this is some of the issues we have with open source software. Open source is everywhere. As we saw from the beginning, it's in our operational systems. Um, it's it, it pervasive all throughout the stacks of technology we use. Um, and often it's very, very dependent on one developer or a couple of developers keeping things up to date and working for us. Um, so here's a little story um, of open source gone wrong. I don't know if anyone knows what these very few lines of code are. It's quite easy to work out because I think the name's in the, uh, in the code. Um, but this is something called LeftPad. Um, it's a really, really simple piece of code. It allows you to add characters at the beginning of a text. So for example, it will add zero to the beginning of a zip code. Very, very simple. Um, actually, any coder could just type this out themselves, right? Um, but coders tend to be a little bit lazy when it comes to their coding. Um, a, a young guy, 28 years old, um, frequently published code to a registry called NPM. It's a place to publish um, code so that other people can use it, specifically JavaScript type applications. And he would often post stuff there. He had a lot of stuff there. He actually had a different piece of software called Kik, K-I-K. Um, but then another company set up um, called Kik.com. It's a chat service. Um, they were doing reasonably well. They wanted to protect their IPR. They had a registered trademark. And they went to this young developer and said, we don't 
mean to be rude about this, but, you know, could you maybe call that piece of code something else? Because this is a registered trademark. We don't want to get the lawyers involved. Um, unfortunately, the young developer just went, had a complete fit over this, said, I'm not changing the name of my code. You'll have to go away. You can sue me. Um, and then in the end, he pulled all of his code out of the registry because of this argument. So not just the kit code, um, but all of the code. A lot of it had no impact whatsoever. He published lots and lots of different pieces of code in many, many different ways. But this specific piece of code, this ridiculous six lines or so of code, caused significant problems because it was used by many, many people pulling directly from the registry. Um, and when this went down, so many different services went down. Um, so that when we think about open source and we think about our use of it, it's not just about a specific tool that we're using, but it could be anywhere within any code that you're using. And it can be very precarious, our dependency on it. Um, open source is absolutely everywhere, as I said. Um, this is a, a fantastic graphic, um, which I didn't put together, I stole from IBM. Um, but it just shows um, all throughout the, the ecosystem, no matter where we are, there can be open source software at work. Um, and this doesn't even really cover some of the open source software we're using regularly within the r &E community. Um, when we started talking, people mentioned things like Shibboleth, Simple SAML, and Casper and I are going to talk a bit more about specific r &E open source um, services as we move on. So open source is everywhere. Um, organizations use it, whether they have a strategy to use it or not, and whether they intend to use it or not. So what can we do about it? And are we focused enough as NRENs, as research and education, as universities on open source and how we're using it? This is a question we've been asking a lot at Géant recently. Um, there's been a big swing towards buying services, particularly end user facing services. Uh, the pandemic had a big impact on that. Everyone rushed out and bought Zoom licenses. Um, people were looking for learning management systems so people could work from home. Um, and those decisions had to be made quickly. So the best idea was just to simply quickly buy something. But is that the best um, thing we should be doing? And can we think about things a little bit more differently? So something that Casper and I are kicking off as part of the community program at Jayant um, is something called the Open Source Software Services Principles. When we think about how we're using open source, we think it's quite difficult to have a specific project on it. Um, every university is different. Every single NREN is different. Um, what we think we can do, though, is all agree on a consistent approach to what we're doing. Um, so we've put together a proposed set of 10 principles. And what we're going to do is firstly get those agreed um, by some of the most active people in our field in terms of open source, um, and then ask NRENs to endorse them, to say, actually, we agree with this. And from the beginning, I think the people in this room perhaps might already agree with them, but we'll see where we're going. Then we intend to run some little campaigns every year focused on one of the different principles. Um, but hopefully that will become a little bit more apparent as I move through these slides. So our very, very first principle is quite a big, big one. It's a statement that we believe that digital sovereignty cannot be achieved without a robust open source infrastructure. Within the EU, digital sovereignty has become a really, really big talking point um, recently. It's one of their main focuses. Um, and there are many pillars looking at this. Lots of different things are driving that forward. Um, there's things like GDPR, which talks a lot about, um, you know, owning your own data, making sure your, the data of your users is looked after well. There was the Schrems case, which challenged um, exchange of information with the US, for example. We've seen things like the US Cloud Act come in, which is causing people a lot of concern. Cloud stands for clarifying lawful overseas use of data. Someone put a lot of work into trying to work out that acronym. Um, but it basically puts requirements on a lot of US-based companies to hand data over uh, to people like the FBI if they're investigating things. Um, and they just have to hand that over. And that's causing a lot of people quite a bit of concern about whether that will happen. And a lot of the disagreement with sharing data um, with the US comes from this. 
Why do we care about that? Well, obviously, a lot of the big five um, service providers that we use all have uh, servers in the US, all have staff based in the US who are processing data. Digital sovereignty, though, has tended to focus pretty much on the data itself. We're really worried about data, both in terms of our research data, um, other data outputs from, from, from our work, and in terms of personal data, so the stuff we hold about our users. There's not been so much focus on the actual infrastructure itself. So where's the technical sovereignty? Are we locked into certain technical implementations? And if we are, it doesn't really matter if our data, if we have data sovereignty, we need to care about the technical um, base and the technical infrastructure too. There's a couple of other things that are happening over in the EU. The EU does have an open source software strategy, but it's sort of sat in the background and not much has happened with it for a long time. Um, and it's also running out in 2024. Um, so we need to think about um, what we're doing there. There's also something in the EU called the EU Digital Decade. And that's all about putting people at the center, providing freedom of choice, uh, safety and security, participation, sustainability. If we start thinking about all of these different things, then actually being locked into big service providers, relying on Amazon, uh, relying on uh, you know Meta and all of their services, are we really doing the right thing for our users? Um, Microsoft would be another big one there. And can we really use those and meet these objectives? And then the final one, which I think is quite important for NRENS, is about public values. We are not just, you know, a commercial organization. We care about our users. We care about what we do. Um, I was really struck listening to the minister in the keynote this morning about how much he cares about what the NRENS are doing and what difference we're making um, in a societal factor. So there's other things that come up around ethics. Um, around how we collaborate, how we innovate that are really, really important. And we can think about all of those as part of an open source strategy and a real driver as to why we should be using open source tools. I'm going to then hand over to Casper to talk about the next couple of principles. So thank you. Um, oh, this is very small on the screen. Um, so, uh, principle number two, we will actively contribute to open source developer communities with code and financing, especially where code is used by NRENS and their community. Um, next couple of slides will go into a little bit more uh, detail on that because I had an idea on how we could do that. Um, and slide number and, and principle number three is we will foster co-creation in NREN communities. Uh, to help build public services across organizational silos and boundaries, including support for capacity to create our own code. And this also um, fits nice, uh, nicely into uh, the next couple of slides. Because I've been thinking about um, creating something called a services starter pack. So, um, Apart, well, Nicole, uh, uh, as Nicole already said in our introduction, that we uh, is that we work a lot in uh, the trust and identity space. Uh, I am the secretary for uh, both Edugain and Edurome, um, and especially in Edu uh, Edugain, um, we see uh, a lot of we have a lot of get a lot of questions about um, services, but also when you look into the entities, and with that I mean identity providers and service providers in. As you gain, you see that for especially the recent joiners in the Edugain service, uh, the entities, a number of entities is uh, fair, are fairly low. Um, this can be due uh, to the fact that more and more federations set up their federations in a way uh, that they use proxies a lot. So on the surface, you will only see one IDP, but in, fair, in fact, it's a, it's, a, it's a proxy with more IDPs uh, behind that. And same goes for SPs. Um, but if you actually go into uh, the detail, you look into the numbers, uh, then still uh, the number of SPs, especially uh, in federations, uh, are still uh, relatively low. Um, and with low number of participation, there is not a lot of metadata. We see a lot of errors uh, in metadata by, with um, recent joiners. Uh, luckily, um, 
they also reach out to us to the support and onto the educate support team and we can help each other out and make their uh, federation more robust uh, but uh, having more metadata would actually, uh, before you actually uh, enter Edugain, would actually help to um, uh, build the maturity of your federation before you even uh, apply to, to Edugain. And also, uh, we have a big difficulty of selling the idea of uh, the federation um, to the constituency, so to identity providers and service providers. Um, I've discussed this with uh, Educate Business Development uh, over and over again. And when he, uh, that's Mario Reale, my, my colleague at Giant. Um, and he says, every time I talk to um, emerging federations uh, or even NRANs that are thinking of setting up a, uh, a federation, uh, you always get the question, um, what services do you offer? And this is a bit of a misconception because Educate in itself is actually the service. Um, but that doesn't mean that Edugain could do more to uh, offer more services through Edugain, uh, make them available uh, for federations to use. Um, and historically, it also has been proven that it's very difficult to provide a good overview of all the services in, uh, in Edugain. There are tools, but you really need to know what you're looking for. It's really specific. It's really hard. It's also, we have looked into the idea of setting up, creating a service catalog many times. Um, and although it's doable, it's really hard to maintain it, to get all the proper information from service providers about their services and which is actually, when which services are actually uh, available uh, for uh, your federation. Um, and then the final, uh, the last problem, um, on this on this slide is the uptake of uh, open source software services uh, in general. It has not much to do uh, with federation per se, but I I really think that identity federations uh, can help uh, with uh, the uptake of um, open source software services. So, what would a service uh, starter pack uh, mean uh, for you? So, and how would it look like? So the idea is then to provide a standard set of federated services. Um, and this will help uh, the federation to become naturally, uh, uh, technically uh, mature enough to join Edugain. Um, and in this case, uh, it would be good to start off with, um, we discussed this with Terry Smith earlier this week, to start off with test bets, test, test instances of these services, just to play around with services. How does it work? What metadata does it create? Um, then you can go to your constituency and can offer these services, create more metadata, make sure that you have uh, all the um, uh, technical skills that it requires to, that, 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 it, that are required to run a federation. And then you can get into Edugain more smoothly uh, and more seamlessly. Um, and then we were thinking, um, these services, what 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 should they be? What must they be? What must they? How? Uh, what should they look like? Well, first and foremost, if we want to do it for identity uh, through, if you want to offer it through uh, identity federations, uh, these services should be federated services. Um, we are talking about open so open source software today, so the services should be open source based. Um, the services uh, on offer should be able to be hosted on prem. Um, so that you have the choice to run it yourself or use it uh, a, a centralized uh, service. And uh, it would be fantastic if uh, these services are developed by the NRAN community and provided to the wider r &E community. Or as we like to say at uh, Giant, drink our own champagne. Yeah, rather than dog food, I think no one really likes to eat dog food, so rather drink champagne instead. Um, so what would be the uh, benefits of uh, such a services uh, starter pack? Uh, it would be really good for the Edugain operations team to do a maturity check. There is more metadata um, because of, there are more services. Uh, so there's more to check and to see if there are any uh, flaws uh, that can be fixed uh, before you even enter uh, services into your metadata feed. Um, 
it also really supports the idea of uh, idea of federation and there's a really good example um from uh indonesia um they've started investigating they started to spawn their identity federation called federasi um and we've been in contact with them because they want to join edugain and we asked them okay what's what's your plan how you want to grow inside your uh inside your country what would you like to offer and they said well at first we had a really hard time selling the idea of of uh of federation identity federation um so what we did and now i have to admit that i stole a bit a little bit of their idea for this services pack um so what they actually did is offer a number of services uh test instance uh, to start off with um but a couple of services uh for uh, file sharing uh edge uh learning management systems and uh, a couple more and show that to uh, their uh, peers, uh, other universities in in, in um, Indonesia, uh, and they started very locally. They are based in Yogyakarta, so they reached out to the other faculties and universities uh, in Yogyakarta. Um, they organized a couple of workshops, and first they got in touch with five other universities and feder and and faculties. And within, they run three or four of these workshops. So they started off with only five of them uh, at the first workshop. And now they're give, doing it for uh, 28 universities and faculties um, uh, when they reach the number of, uh, the, 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 when they reach the fourth uh, workshop. So that's really impressive. This all happened within a year. Uh, so you can see a, 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 a steep uh, a curve here, exponential growth. And, um, what is mind boggling to me is that they also told me that there are about 3000 uh, potential IDPs that can that could potentially join their federation. So if they're already at 28 now and that, that number keeps on doubling, they'll have uh, probably one of the largest uh, federations uh, in the world um, on the IDP uh, front. Um, so it supports the idea of federation because you offer services you can tell your constituency well this is what you can actually do uh, with federated services this is what you can offer to your students to your researchers to your uh, teachers uh, the other benefit of course is then the uptake of oss services because there are more people using it uh, and then also more federations uh, that are using it and um with this service pack, the idea is that it um, it's a list of services. You don't have to use them all. You can just pick. You can also choose between uh, different uh, flavors of, of the services. And that is what I will show in, in two slides. Um, this is uh, a bit more discussion. Uh, so what services um, should be included in this uh, starter pack? Um, what should it look like? So if you reach out to the Edugain service and ask for the starter pack, what would we actually offer you? And what are other benefits of using um, uh, a service pack, a starter pack? And I would be very happy to get your input on that. Uh, you can think of that now. This, this question will be uh, uh, asked uh, later uh, in the session, at the end of the session. Um, so we can, I'd love to hear your ideas on this uh, as well. So um been thinking about uh, some of the service that could be offered. Um, and earlier this week, I realized this became, this is actually quite a, a relevant uh, topic because in the uh, identity management, uh, identity and access management uh, sessions uh, earlier this week, uh, quite a few of the participants asked about killer apps. Um, this is a list of six services so i would talk about a uh, not not about killer apps but about a killer six pack um but yeah in, in all fairness there is no killer app that will attract all of uh, uh that will attract uh, your universities uh, and research institutions but maybe if you can offer a package then uh, it becomes uh, more interesting um so we have been thinking about a couple of types of services, uh, which uh, all of these uh, have been created in the uh, NREN community um, 
of no, not not all of them, but most of them have been. Um, so we think about Azure VPN, uh, VPN, which is obviously a new VPN uh, service, uh, Azure Meet and Rendezvous uh, video conference uh, services. Uh, one uh, was created in uh, the um, Jean project. The other one was created by the French uh, Federation of a French uh, NREN Renater. Um, we've been thinking about offering a Confluence or Wiki. Uh, file sender, we already saw that on the um, list uh, you know, on the Mentimeter uh, earlier. Uh, so that's a file sharing solution. Um, mailing list manager, uh, we use Simpa, uh, open source software, uh, also created by the French uh, um, NREN. And we're thinking about event managers, and there are also a couple of flavors there, and that's what I mean with pick and choose. You don't have to get all of them, but you can use some of them. Uh, there are probably uh, more than one solution per um, uh, type of service, so you can choose which one of them uh, suits your uh, uh, constituents best. And well, later today I will ask you uh, if you can think of other services that would be that would fit well in uh, a uh, services starter pack. So what should it look like? Um, my basic idea was that it would be very, uh, very simple. Um, basically an instruction manual. So how do you set up uh, these services? And this would be a collection of all these installation instructions basically, uh, which will uh, also describe how you should set up and run these services yourself. And uh, with contact detail, pro details provided of the core services team. So well, in case of the Azure VPN uh, team, uh, of Azure VPN, uh, their core uh, service team, uh, and they can help you and guide you with setting up yourself, but you can run the services yourself. And the support, um, has, and, and, and here we see a little bit of a shift that the Identity Federation becomes the service provider. Um, what does that mean for support? Um, first level support is you talking to your uh, constituents um, if they have questions. Um, you should be the first uh, first level of support, first line of contact. Um, and if you uh, are not sure how to solve uh, the questions and the support that is asked, um, then you can also always reach out to the core services team. Uh, they will provide the second level of support. Um, this could also have other benefits, the starter pack, uh, because you're setting up your federation from scratch and with services um, uh, in a way that you would like to set it up, uh, you can uh, you could start thinking of introducing uh, entity categories, specific entity categories. We discussed this uh, in depth over the last couple of days in the IM uh, sessions. Those have all been recorded. So uh, if you don't know uh, about uh, know know much about uh, identity categories, I would. Um, um, like to refer you to the, the recordings of these uh, sessions. Um, and the other benefit of open source software in general is that you have an influence on the development of the service. So you could work all new features yourself, or you could ask the core service team if they can look in, will are willing to look into new features or new pl uh, plugins um, anyway um, to make a service uh, most suitable for your organization and for your um, constituency. And with that, I leave it, well, I'll give the mic back to Nicole. So some software service or some open source software uh, already has uh, fairly well documented integrations into Shibboleth and other open source identity tools. Uh, will you be looking at providing linkage, links to those as well as um, this additional documentation around how to set this stuff up? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we're lucky enough. Oh, we're lucky enough to work quite closely with a lot of the development teams and we're hoping to really get them on board and actually look at um, pulling support from them as well. So I'm a network operation guy from the uh, Japan and the uh, I was kind of looking at on the website and found that the network management as a service. So the uh, 
in that sense, the, uh, there was the, uh, I, I didn't quite remember uh, strictly, but the, uh, there was some Helm chat available for the Kubernetes service server. So the, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure it is related what you are working on or not, but the, uh, you know, the, uh, that is far beyond some manual. So the, <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess I want, uh, how about that? So the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, tuning, uh, tiny up the uh, Kubernetes services. Not a quite a job for the, uh, in the uh, 2023. So the, uh, maybe, uh, I guess indeed this is a bit out of scope of the of the federation starter pack. But uh, as Nicole explained in the, uh, at the start, is that we just are well re reiterating this work on open source software uh, within Giant and and within the community. Um, so hopefully, at some point in time, in the not so <laughs> in the not in the not so distant future, um, this will be uh, far more comprehensive, right? So it also includes network operations. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Track. Yeah, I mean, we're focusing more on user-facing um, services that use open source at the moment within this initiative, but we're hoping this principles work will really give a refocus across the board. So yeah, things like the network management tools, where they're also using a lot of open source tools and trying to develop out in, in that space as well. Um, definitely better people to talk about that space than Casper and I, um, but and people like Enzo and Helga at the conference too. So they'll be good to chat too. Uh, so actually what I would have thought adding a help decks within the starter pack so because when you are enrolling a new services there will be a lot of users coming with multiple questions and uh, and then having small workforce so it might be useful to go or some sort of kb yeah um uh, that's definitely something we're looking at and this next section actually speaks to those challenges a bit um it's something we're hoping to do um there'll definitely be some level of support um we're still working out how deep we can go with that um but as you say the kind of the tools that we're talking about, like Edgy VPN, Shibboleth, Simple SAML, those kind of things, we know the development teams well. So we're going to build up a relationship with them and it would actually benefit them to work with us on providing that support out um, because support for open source is a big challenge space, which is part of this next point. I think there's another question behind you, Casper. Yeah, I'm, I'm Bashuki, I'm from Indonesia. Yeah, we it's yeah we try to develop the like the A2 ROM and A2 game. Yeah, it's uh it's different. Right, sometimes maybe Andres mentioned about the different things like, yeah yeah even uh, uh our our uh equipment is uh, mostly in Indonesia not 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 compatible with the yeah standard of it uh one X one X protocol. Yeah, that's that's what 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 that's that's what's happened in indonesia so that's why uh not many universities will uh, join because yeah this the authentication system is is uh, rather different and the, the second actually i will i will ask about the sustainability itself sustainability of yeah yeah you mentioned about the support and yeah sustainability because uh, okay for example like right now uh, we uh, we in indonesia mostly using the open source mm -hmm. but yeah, you see, like uh, in the beginning, we used the FreeBSD, and then the FreeBSD support uh, one release is, is around two two years, and then we move to the CentOS, CentOS, yeah. and then CentOS is five years. But now CentOS is not support again, and then now we we move to Ubuntu or in the Debian. So, ah, uh, it is uh, for the admin maybe this is very very uh, very very uh, 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 it's difficult. Yeah, when when we have to move one to the other and then do, do you have a, something like a Zian, uh, have a, some idea about how to make, maintain something like that you know, like the, the, the sustainability like uh yeah this this is this is what 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 we try to yeah to to establish actually thank you yeah absolutely um and this is why we're focusing on a very small set of services uh, you remember at the beginning i showed that massive chart we couldn't say we could support all of that so we're starting off with a small set and we're hoping to move it forward um but i think it's a good point to move forward um because all of your comments kind of speak to the next two of our open source principles that we're developing 
Um, the first one is we will support open source projects with sustainable business plans and in specifically outside of project funding. Um, because one of the issues we've seen, particularly with people who are used to um, EC project funding or other big government funding, is that when that runs out, all of the support vanishes and disappears. So we need models that can support things outside of secular project funding. And the second one is we will support sustainable infrastructures for services built on open source software. And this is also speaks to the, uh, the starter pack that Casper was just talking about. Um, but I don't think I have to say to anyone in this room that open source is not just code. You can have your guy sitting writing code saying, I want to make that available out to everyone. That's super cool. That can be super, super useful. But once things get used in a robust way, um, more and more things are needed. So we start with the code, but then any code needs auditing. It needs testing. It needs looking at compliance and security checks. And that's often much better done by someone who's not the original coder. So how do we get that done? Uh, we need things like IPR, copyright, licenses, contributor agreements. And if you're a guy who just wants to write code, you're not going to be wanting to think, sit there thinking about IPR and getting people to sign documents. You need help and support there. We need marketing. We need to promote them. We have things like EduVPN, which have beautiful websites. Our developers aren't doing that. You know, someone else is doing that for them. Customer support is the next big thing, really, really important. How is that being done? Is it just being done through mailing lists, through community support, or is there a help desk you can go to? Or can you buy support in some way to support what you're doing locally? And then most importantly, at the end, how is all of this being financed? Um, I can't remember the number of times when I've spoken to people and they've just gone financing, but open source is free. <laughs> Yeah, someone is always paying for the development somewhere, whether it's individuals contributing their time and effort, whether it's organizations contributing that back out into the community. Um, but everyone knows that creating open source is not free and having an open source service within your infrastructure is not free. You need the manpower. You need the people to support it. One of the things we did in the EU to try and look at this was we created something called the Commons Conservancy. And I'm actually one of the board members of the Commons Conservancy. When I started at Cheyant 10 years ago, two years ago, 10 years ago, um, we were looking at how we could best support our open source projects at the time. We were looking at things like Shibboleth and Simple SAML. Um, and there was no mechanism that worked for us. All the big conservancies were US based. Um, that was a challenge for us in terms of uh, the way that our, our um, software was financed and supported. It was a challenge for us making how we were developing fit their model. Um, and it really didn't quite meet all of our needs. We wanted something that addressed all of these points that I just went through um, and that really helped developers directly to build up their um, projects into robust and secure um, open source services. So this is why we created the Common Conservancy. It's a not-for-profit foundation. Um, it's quite an interesting one. It cannot receive money. Um, it's entirely forbidden from taking and handling money. We do have mechanisms in place to allow projects to be funded, but the Conservancy cannot um, take in any money. Um, and what that does is it invites uh, open source projects to apply, um, to become part of the Conservancy when they apply. We have a long conversation with them about what they need, what support do they need? Are they looking for a developer? Do they need legal support? Do they need help marketing? Do they need help setting up a way of bringing money in? Um, and the Conservancy will do all of those things. It doesn't do coding itself. It's just a framework to help you find all of those pieces of the puzzle so that you can provide a decent software. You can focus on the coding. You can focus on what you're specialized at um, and we'll take care of everything else. Um, it's been pretty successful. We've quite a number of um, projects or programs, as we call them, in the Conservancy there. A lot of the R&E projects are now in the Commons Conservancy. So if you're interested in that, please do and go and take a look. But keeping an eye on time, because we're running out quickly, I'm going to hand over to Casper to talk about six and seven of our principles. So principle six, we will support and promote open source alternatives to proprietary services. And principle seven, we will position procurement activities to be welcoming to open source initiatives. 
the next, um, just a little bit of a disclaimer, the next two slides uh, we borrowed from uh, René Teyer from their uh, TNC presentation, which was excellent. Uh, so thanks, René Teyer, for borrowing your slides. Um, uh, that also means that these bikes have are not relevant to this um, uh, presentation whatsoever. They were in their slides, but we kept them because it's a happy picture. Um, but the title is uh, very relevant, uh, Go Figures. And uh, I think they deliberately called it Figures because um, what we hear, hear a lot if you're talking about um, newly created open source software services is that, yeah, it doesn't really work well and we need more computing power. We need a node here and we need a node there. And the service doesn't offer that yet. Uh, so it doesn't, it cannot do the thing that we wanted to do. But uh, as a, a famous Dutch uh, football player once said, sometimes uh, things need to happen before they actually happen. So if you actually are running um, uh, these open source software, uh, open source software services, um, yeah, you are actually becoming a part of the solution. You add gravitas to these services, and these numbers uh, speak uh, for themselves. Uh, so their um, Evento serv uh, service, it's a event manager, but also um, something similar as uh, Doodle, so you can uh, schedule dates. Um, in a year's time, they had uh, 250,000 uh, uh, surveys run on that uh, with 2 million users. Um, and in a couple of other examples, uh, rendezvous, uh, 150,000 uh, video uh, calls made by more than 20,000 users. And the list uh, grows on. Uh, file sender, 9 million up uh, uploads and 25 million downloads. That is quite a substantial number. Um, and uh, their final service that is hosted by uh, 45 of their uh, organizations uh, that, are, that are part of their NREN. Um, this 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 shows that it's fairly easy um, to in a medium sized country like like France to to create this this user base, um, which will also uh, help you to uh, convince your management that it's worth investing in OSS services. Um, but then, why free software? There are, uh, there are uh, positive as well as negative uh, preconceptions here. Um, first, the positive ones. It works well. It's better than propriety because we do it ourselves. Uh, it defines interoperability standards. It's completely adaptable. We can make it work as, uh, as we want. But there are also negative preconceptions. It's always buggy. Bug, fix bug fix fixes are always late compared to proprietary services. Uh, and it's probably due because it's impossible to find good tax. Uh, and it costs as much as proprietary services, uh, but it actually causes more work for us. And the end users will probably hate it. Um, guess what? These are all misconceptions. Um, so a couple of examples of, of services uh, that have been mentioned in the starter pack, but also uh, on the level below. Um, these are commercial services versus open source services. Uh, Zoom and Edumeet. Um, we've been in a session at TNC where people said, well, Edumeet is not quite there yet. And then I asked, well, did you actively invest it in, in Edumeet? Because if you do, if you install the node yourself, if you install the service yourself, you become a part of, well, the solution. You add more computing power. So you can actually do exactly the same thing as Zoom and uh, talk to the uh, service team of Edumeet and they are launching their 2.0 version that actually integrates uh, file center into the um, uh, into into the video conferencing services, which is great. Um, but also you can also see how you can use uh, WeTransfer file center can do exactly the same thing. You can decide to use a commercial VPN. Absolutely not, uh, nothing wrong with that. But we also have Azure VPN, um, and then on the uh, identity management uh, uh, side, yeah, Microsoft Azure is 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 uh, widely used. But yeah, uh, Azure is predominantly run on on Shibboleth. So 
I'm not saying that using commercial uh, um, software is wrong. Absolutely not. Um, but there are good alternatives that are open source. Um, I think the next slide is yours. <laughs> Point seven. Yeah, so to speak to point seven, another big issue we find is that a lot of NRENs are actively required to procure anything they buy. Um, and this seems to be very common with NRENs who have a close affiliation with government um, or ministries where they have to be really, really careful about where they invest and spend their money. So many NRENs are required to undertake a procurement process for all purchases. So if they want to install something, they often say to us, we simply can't use the open soft version. I have to run a procurement. An open source software can't respond to a procurement. So that's a, a big problem we're looking to address and looking to work with NRENs on. The other one is that they have difficulty to contribute to open source projects. They'd like to give them money to sustain them, but it's very, very difficult. Donations are very, very difficult to make, particularly if you're a not-for-profit organization yourself. You need an audit trail. People don't understand just giving money out to people. Um, the projects themselves don't have robust invoicing or contractual approaches. This is something the Commons Conservancy is trying to address. And that there's a lack of clear service level agreements or formal support channels. So commercial services can sometimes be easier from a financial perspective. So people just go ahead, put out a tender, get a, a, a commercial solution, even if it's more expensive. Um, and this is something we're really going to be focusing on in the EC over the next year or so, because we want to find solutions for our NRENs to free them up and enable them to use more open source software. So we're moving few, uh, forward just to the last few points now. Um, so eight and nine focus more on processes. Um, and our principle number eight is we will provide mechanisms to support the legal licensing and IPR issues faced by open source projects. And number nine, we'll make sure the code we use and the code that we share is free from vulnerabilities by applying continuous security testing. Something that's very, very important, but something that's very, very costly in terms of time and money. Um, does anyone know what this symbol stood for? Yeah, so this was Heartbleed. Um, it's quite a long time ago now, um, even though some software still has the vulnerability in it. Um, but this caused quite a big impact because OpenSSL is in a lot of services that people were using at the time. Anything that needed to be secured, you could pretty much um, bet that OpenSSL was um, uh, in there somewhere. Um, it was uh, found in the cryptography layer. Um, it was introduced to the software, actually, the, sorry, the, uh, the um, vulnerability was actually introduced to the software in 2012, but was only publicly revealed in, 20, in 2014. So that's quite scary. This vulnerability was in place for quite a long um, time. Up until that point, there was significant usage of OpenSSL, but nobody was supporting it. No one was giving any money to it. Um, the yearly donations to the OpenSSL projects before Heartbleed were about 2,000 US dollars a year. I mean, what can you do with that? Next to nothing. Um, at the time, OpenSSL only had two people to write, maintain, test, and review 500,000 lines of business critical code. And they weren't full time. These were just two guys trying to keep this up and running. And that business critical thing is so important here. Um, and the overall impact was um, estimated to be around 500 million US dollars. So 2,000 US dollars worth of input, uh, you know, donations gets you a, a, an impact of a cost of 500 million US dollars. The good news is this led to the creation of something called Project Zero at Google, which really focused on these kinds of pieces of software and that keeping an eye on these kind of vulnerabilities and finding ways to fund and support them. It led to significantly more funding for OpenSSL. Um, but that's too late, right? The vulnerability had already happened. The issue had already happened. It would have been much better if we had looked at this beforehand. It was a massive failure of risk analysis on our part. We just weren't thinking about what our critical infrastructure was depending on. Um, looking at some of the other things, this is one of my colleagues, Madeleine Raska. Um, she's been working a lot on IPR policies for us. It's boring work, uh, but it's really essential work. 
And this isn't about really protecting our IPR. This isn't us trying to do a land grab and saying this is ours. This is just about being very clear about our IPR, particularly if we are providing services out to people. Um, for example, we provide a lot of code through things like EduRoam and EduGain. Is our IPR policy very clear on that? If we've had a developer work on that project, are we clear that we own their IPR so we can make it available to other people? She's done a fantastic piece of work on that. If people are interested in the policy, I'm happy to share it. We're happy for people to reuse it um, if they want to locally. And then something else we do, um, and this is funded through one of the only things we've been talking about today, which is actually funded through the GM5 project, is we do a lot of work on providing secure code services for our community. Um, we have something called the School of Software Engineering, which runs yearly. Um, where a bunch of our developers all get together and geek out together and have a lot of fun um, and also work on each other's code, challenge each other's code. We provide um, a lot of software best practices. Uh, we do secure code reviews. Um, we find it challenging. It's in labor intensive work. We can only fund and support so many um, pieces of code review through that, but we find it really, really important. And we're trying desperately to expand that out. Um, and then finally, we have a software catalog so people can find out a bit more about some of the software that's made available. But this is just GN5 project focused. We're trying to find ways to scale that outside the project. So I think that brings us on to our last point. And I think it's a very important point to make. All of these things we've talked about are not about being militant about open source. It's about saying there's an alternative and there's a different way of doing things. And we support all of these actions around open source as part of a mixed ecosystem. So we want to select and work with both open and closed environments to best need, meet the needs of the NREN community. So as both Casper and I have said several times, um, this isn't about you must use open source, commercial is bad. It's about just saying, let's not just rely on commercial. Let's look at our options. Let's think about a mixed ecosystem because actually that can provide more benefits for our community. There's lots of areas where we think we need to do a lot of work, not just at Géant, but hopefully with our global partners as well. And we'd be interested in talking to all of you guys about this. Um, we feel that a shift to buy rather than build over the last 10 years or so has really shifted attention away from open source software. And this means we are not paying attention to risks and dependencies. It's definitely true that our developer capacity has declined um, lots of people have been drawn away. Why would you work for an Enron if you can go and work for Google? We need to make that more attractive again. But where we do have developer capacity, we are not necessarily smart in its application. Um, we often develop multiple of the same products rather than collaborating. I can give an example recently. Uh, three of our NRENs have all developed uh, digital signing services. All of them are open source. All of them can be used by anyone else, but all developed completely in silos. It's not a very smart application of a very small um, amount of resource. We definitely need more work to professionalize our support for homegrown open source software, our own software that we're developing. And the Commons Conservancy is one step towards that. We developed that, but then we kind of stopped. We need to do more. Um, and we really think we need a position as to how we ethically use open source software. So this is about saying, OK, if I take this open source software, if I'm going to use OpenSSL, if I'm going to use, for example, Indico, which is the Géant event management system, am I just taking it or are we contributing back in some way? Because if I'm getting something for free, can I give back? And that doesn't necessarily mean um, a payment or donation. It could be giving back in developer time, in helping with bug fixes, in being involved in the community boards around discussions. But if we are taking, let's think about how we give back. So those are our 10 open source principles. Um, they're here, they're a little small, but hopefully you can look at the slides afterwards. Our next step is we are gonna get these ratified by something called the Géant Community Committee. Um, and then we're going to publish them and we'll be asking NRENs and other organizations to endorse them and then to help work with us on trying to solve some of the problems we've talked about today in this slide deck and also try and provide some of the solutions like the service pack that Casper talked about. I'm going to hand back over to Katzma now. Yes, because this is the end of our slide deck, but we have one more um, 
Uh, how you call it? One more survey to go. And I now have to start that one up and share the screen. So I'd like to ask you to, let's see, what's the good one? That one. Sure. To go to menti.com again. Uh, now we have a different code uh, to enter the uh, the survey. So that's 2182666. And then the first question, I think you can start uh, entering your, well, entries uh, immediately. Um, what services would you like to see in the starter packs? Would you like to have us adding more services to this starter pack. But as uh, we got the question earlier, um, let's open it up. Um, where can we work together on what services, open OSS services that we know of that are um, NREN built, NREN community built? Uh, could we do more uh, together? And the first answer is already great because those are two services I haven't heard about. So let's give us more homework. It's good. File Center, yes. And we see in File Center, we see um, a lot of spawning emerging uh, identity federations uh, testing out their uh, uh, their IDPs and, and SPs with, 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 with File Center. That's good. Routing, PKI, DNS. Mattermost Docker images. Edge of VBN, yeah. More DNS. I'm going to wait for Terry until he. Uh managed to uh, get into Menti. OpenStack. And again, um, more services that do more or less the same is not a bad thing. I think that leaves the, that gives the, uh, gives you the opportunity to to choose whatever you want, what works best for you, right? So I'll remove this, otherwise we don't see what's notebooks. Oh, quite a few ideas. Um if over the matter of time you come up with more, then you can always reach uh, out to us. Oh, there's still more entries coming in. The um, the DevSecOps is, ops is interesting. Um, we're doing quite a bit of work on that at Shayon too. Um, really realizing that there's a lot of work to be done in that space. I don't think it will be our primary focus, um, but we're definitely going to be talking to those guys about how we can work together. Um, yeah, because we have so many different tools we're using in that space, mixed economy, um, sometimes overlapping tools and just trying to get a, a, a better handle on what we're doing and, and what decisions we're making to support um, that kind of work. Yeah, big blue button is a good one. Um, you know, things like a Mattermost as well would be interesting, I think, to add to the portfolio. Yep, absolutely. And it's good to see that most of these um services are also very yeah, well, very interoperable. And um today actually we uh would have done this set run the session with a um Third colleague from Nordinet, E. Kickenborg, who has a lot of experience in the uh, uh, technical implementation of services. Um, unfortunately, uh, he couldn't make it uh, to Sri Lanka. Um, but uh, we've uh, I've worked with Eric um, on a couple of projects uh, in the past um, that are looking into learning management systems and their operability with other other solutions. And then we found out that it's really 
that open source is really suitable uh, when it comes down to operability with, well, other services. Um, okay, next question. Thank you for your responses. Um, so how should we go about? Uh, I have my ideas. I think Nicole has hers, uh, but we'd like to hear it from you. So uh, this effort uh, on OSS services uh, should be managed and supported on a local level. Would you like to prefer to run it by yourself? Regional level? Um, so, well, the APEN region, um, global level, or it depends on the service, which is always the easy answer, but uh, probably also the most true answer. Right, so uh, answers coming in. Um, it depends on the service. Yes, uh, I agree, but I'm also happy to see that we got some regional and global level answers here. Um, we'd like to run this as a community thing. And of course we are here representing Jayant, but I think um, when it comes down to open source software, this these services are global services, right? We don't only do it in, well, our home offices in, in the Netherlands or the UK. Um, this and, and, and the service become better um, with more input from more uh, uh, areas, more countries. Um, so when you say uh, like regional level, um, if you had a project group or a uh, an activity we've got our bio commons community and that community runs a bunch of software at the regional level but then shares it globally as well uh, they're on all sorts of stuff they're actually bringing that into the federation mm -hmm. so it's not the federation operator that's got to do all the hard work and run this stuff absolutely there are that. other communities that you can go and talk to who already have stuff out there but would benefit from joining a, a, an identity federation and uh, having a global um, collaboration activity. Yep, yep, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and think of use cases for local level and regional level that would come, come down to services that are uh, only um, targeting specific languages, for instance. I mean, English is a global, globally used language, but if you offer a service uh, only in Dutch, then it doesn't really uh, make sense to, to run this uh, on an international scale, because there are well not many people who are <laughs> using a service that is only in Dutch. Yeah, and I think there are a, a definite ways where we can mix um, the, the support models there. So file senders is a good example. They provide support centrally, um, the coding's done centrally, um, but translations have been uh, sort of donated um, for the interface from various native speakers so that we can make sure that an organization who wants it in their native language can get access to that. Um, and that's just done through some simple translation. We've kept the uh, interface as simple as possible. So the translation work is minimal um, and that gets contributed through a, 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 a Git, Git hub repository. Um, and that's a really simple way that regional level support can be added um, to a more global level um, initiative. Okay, then I think this is the final question. So if you're interested in joining this activity, what can your organization bring to the table? What can you offer? Um, no support is also a good answer. Completely understand that, especially uh, we see that globally that, that we and Nicole talked about it as well. Um, staffing issues, um, and resourcing issues uh, hit all of us. So. But it seems like you really like to be involved in here. And that is really nice to see. Oh, well, that's good. We have eight people in the room who can do the maintenance for some of these services <laughs> that we have discussed earlier today. Um, 
no this this is really good and i'm i'm, I'm very happy uh, that we uh that we uh were allowed to run the session today uh at this conference um because well we've just as I said we just initiated this uh, uh this work um a couple of months ago um but it's really nice to see that uh that there are more people that well more or less think the same as us we should do this again we should investigate a little bit more um i think this was yep that was the final um final question um we will publish the slides we'll also publish the uh results of the um uh of these two surveys on wufa so if you want to uh, look it back uh, later. That is possible. Um, the we are yeah. You can always reach out to us. Um, come to see us. Well, today Nicole's leaving end of the day, but well, we will be there at dinner. But also tomorrow, uh, contact us online. Um, and if you have questions at a later point in time, also very welcome to to reach out to us. Um, maybe before we really close the session um maybe you have questions or comments um now which you would like to share with us or maybe also people online if you have questions the floor is open hi hi i'm shankar from malaysia so i'm just having a question on the notion of starter pack that you had so are you looking at a package of tools and services that will come together or uh, are we looking at let's say deployment of them one by one or are we looking at something like the turnkey linux solutions where we pretty much have them to auto deploy as we wish that's i uh, at this point in time i'd like to keep it as simple as possible so um probably it's me who's going to do the work is um well i i've, I've shared these uh, well maybe i can get the, the that slide back that's maybe uh maybe useful to do that um Go back all the French slides. Uh, we there we are here. So this this was just some initial ideas, right? So um, we can we can add um, we can scrape things off if there is no uh, need for these services. But I think the most important thing about this is. Um, that you are not obliged to take up all the services, it's pick and choose. Also, it would be really great to, uh, and and therefore this this uh, these two surveys really help uh, help me uh, to collect different services that do more or less the same thing. So, uh, the, so we saw we discussed a big blue button, so that should be added to the list of uh, uh, rendezvous and edge meet, whatever works for you, um, and then um, yeah, I think the simplest thing to do because. I also have limited uh, hours in a week um, is to uh, compile uh, these instruction manuals, how to download, how to run it yourself. Um, and then as Nicole said, we are in close contact with service teams uh, that actually develop these services, um, make them aware that that this is coming, right? That you are coming, that you're going to ask them for help. And well, I know that they're quite passionate about their product. So they are probably also very passionate to help you uh, setting up uh, these services yourselves um, but yeah again you can pick whatever you want but at least you have something then on offer and can share yeah, the show and my, share. my question wasn't about what ah. will be there how it will be deployed ah, so, so I, yeah um, so obviously with any open source there's different models we could be looking at um, so for some people it may be that they just simply want to download their own instance run it locally that level of support is the easiest so then we'd be looking at simply as Casper said making sure there's good installation guides you have support we're working with the project teams but also thinking about I mean, th that in itself is a challenge, though, right? That's a lot of work. Lots of organizations just don't have um, the capacity for that. Certain things um, are more difficult, something like edgy VPN, we wouldn't be able to offer a centralized service for. Um, but there are a couple of the options where we're saying, OK, well, we have filesender.shayon.org. Can we make that available for other people? Um, are there other hosting um options we can look at? That's going to be a slower process. We may introduce one thing. We have a couple of 
options I can think about that would be easy to do and see if we can scale up. Um, but step one would be sort of like the pack, the instructions, local download, local support, then second level, can we provide, you know, hosting for people um, and then slowly moving up as we go along. So are you from a university? Yeah, so your university might want to stand up the service, but for the whole of the nation. Yeah, and, and that's what we have a lot of in Australia. This university will run it for everybody across the, the nation rather than each university running their own instance. And when you start going down that model, other universities will start helping you uh, run that service, keep it going, giving you support, running local support teams at their universities just to support that centralised service. Not run by the NREN, but run by you guys. And that's a really good model. Otherwise, I think it's just to say thank you so much for coming. It was lovely to see so many people here. Um, if you want any more information, you know where to find us. You can come scan our badges. Um, and we'd love to keep the conversation going and hopefully come back uh, with a bit more of a developed service for you at some point in the future. So thank you all very much. Thank you.